All right, so good morning, guys. Uh, today, we're going to focus mainly on real-life situations, uh, what you're going to be doing in practice. And so um, we're going to discuss really quickly how you come up with a uh, plan to treat people with herbs, and I'll discuss the sort of general approach and how you treat some common conditions in practice. And uh, give you some cases on sort of what happened. So a lot of the cases that, like I've treated thousands of people over the years, and uh, so I'm trying to grab cases that would be good examples to illustrate, uh, you know, sort of the things we might do in practice. And it's not just using herbal medicine. I tried my best to grab uh, some. I was updating it last night. I was up till midnight, and then I was up early this morning trying to add in some more cases. It's it's hard because on all my case, I just switched over all my records to electronic medical records. So a lot of the stuff I have to go through the old files and dig it up. And if I was smart, I would be writing this down as I go, but practice is busy and it's not my priority when I'm uh, in a busy day in clinic. So uh, there's so many great cases I've had. I just haven't recorded them all and I haven't uh, put them all in here. So, um, so I did my best to include some, but I think you'll, you guys will find it useful. It may not necessarily exemplify um, everything that I want, but uh, it's pretty good. And so I modified this lecture from last year, I added a couple things. Uh, the other thing that, um, sorry, I'm a little tired today. The other thing that, I did different ones. I created a, a few slides and just in general, how do you create botanical tinctures? Okay. And so for the last lecture, I uploaded a recording that you can watch in advance for that. And then during that time slot, I'm going to still be available. We'll do a optional lecture, more of an exam review where we go through some cases. Um, and uh, you guys, I'll send you the cases in advance. So you guys can kind of come up with, um, try to work on them in, in advance. It'll be like a little study aid for you, and then we can discuss. I think it should be helpful for you guys, okay? So the first thing we're going to talk about is how to prescribe herbs. And so when a patient comes into your practice, they're going to have a, a number of, usually they have symptoms, and you have to ask your case, uh, uh, gather information for your case. And so you ask a bunch of questions, and you find out what symptoms they have or what, uh, you know, labs they might have that sort of support what your um, assessment's going to be. And once you have sort of the basic sort of symptoms or signs or, or the condition that you know you're going to be treating, then you create a list of actions that you think would be appropriate for this case. Now, generally speaking, when someone comes into your practice, they usually come in with more than one complaint. So they might come in with heartburn and constipation and... Um, maybe some depression, and maybe some anxiety, maybe high blood pressure. And it would be wonderful if you could make a tincture that covered all those complaints or conditions that they are, they're coming in with, but it's not always possible. So you need to create a list of like the primary actions that you want for this patient's case. And so if they're coming with heartburn, maybe you want a bitter or a demulsant or whatever it is. And if you're able to use herbs that also have, let's say, oops, I just turned my webcam off. Was it getting glitchy for you guys a bit? So if someone comes in and they've got blood pressure issues along with their digestive issues, you might be able to customize it to include certain herbs or to avoid certain herbs to help with those secondary issues. So you want to make sure you make a list of sort of the essential actions that you want, and then maybe secondary actions that would be nice to have. Um, and you do your best, you know, to include that. The problem with creating a verbal formula is if you had someone with lots of things going on and you tried to create a tincture that addressed every single thing and they had diabetes and blood pressure and cholesterol and anxiety and depression and everything else, you might end up having to give them such a a uh, large volume of uh, herbs every single day in tincture form that it may just 
be one prohibitively expensive and two they could just literally be drunk because they're taking a shot of alcohol four times a day so um you have to be able to balance the practicality of giving them herbs and usually if you're giving someone herbs you typically if you're giving like a tincture the tinctures are kind of expensive so you don't really want to be giving more than one or you know one and a half teaspoons a few times a day um especially long term and if you're giving acutely you might be able to give a tablespoon of a herbal thing to treat like an infection but long term it's just you can't afford to do that or the patient can so anyways you gather your actions that you want to give your primary actions are the main things that are required and the secondary actions would be things that would be nice to address but maybe less essential, okay? Um, finally, what you wanna do is look at the herbs, look at the case and see if there's any safety concerns. So if someone is pregnant, you can't give certain herbs like golden seal because uh, they're in abortifacient or if they have high blood pressure, uh, you don't wanna use licorice in the formula necessarily. I mean, that's kind of a gray area. You could use it acutely or you could use it in small amounts if you monitor blood pressure, but you wouldn't wanna, you know, someone's blood pressure dangerously high at 200 over 100 or 120 or whatever it is, you wouldn't want to necessarily give them that, okay? So finally, you've got your actions, you've got your safety concerns, you've kind of teased out what you might want to look out for, and then you go and select your herbs. Now, once you have your herbs, you've got to figure out how much to give to the person. And this is sort of a tricky thing because most herbs will have varying dosage range. And there's a range that where the herbs are effective and then if you go too high, it could be dangerous. If you go too low, it could be ineffective. And one of the challenges is that if you're creating a formula with three or four herbs, you've got to figure out a way to do this all simultaneously um, and do it on when you're busy with a patient. To do the math can be a little bit time consuming. So I, I've created a little tool for you guys that you might want to uh, get, and I'll show it to you in a second. Um, so then you figure out how much of each herb you want to put in the formula what the daily dose is going to be, and then you got to put it in the bottle, okay? So, to give you an example, here's a woman who comes in. She's a 45-year-old woman. She's got digestive issues and gallstones, uh, and she also has been diagnosed with a fatty liver, and we'll talk about that later on. And so she also gets some cramping in the upper right quadrant when she eats certain foods. She tends to be bloated. Um, and she also, blood work reveals she's got high blood uh, blood cholesterol levels, HbA1c, which is a marker for um, uh, diabetes risk is elevated, and then liver enzymes are also elevated. So in general, she's got a number of complex things going on that we want to address, okay? Now, the most important thing is you've got to ask the patient, what is your goal for coming in? Is it for me to treat the cholesterol? Is it for me to treat your blood sugar? Is it to treat the gallstones is it just to get rid of the bloating and the cramping pains and you want to make sure you know that you know what that concern is for the patient because you don't want to be wasting time and the patient's resources treating something that you think is most important without being on the same page as the patient because if the patient's like i don't care about my diabetes someone else is managing that i just want you to get rid of my constipation then you focus on that you know you can tell them you can help them but if they don't want your help you don't want to be giving them uh, all sorts of therapies that aren't going to help or that could help them, but it's not what they came in for. And that's what informed consent is all about as well. So like you need to make sure the patient knows what you're treating, they agree to, and also if there's any safety concerns with it as well. So I'm going to turn my camera back on and see if it slows down. You guys are still hearing everything okay? Any issues with the... Uh, with the uh, transmission. Good. So for this particular person, I look at the signs and symptoms. And so those would be, let's say gallstones would be something that we found out on an ultrasound. They also have cramping pains and bloating, maybe a little bit of heartburn, elevated cholesterol, uh, the liver is uh, inflamed. So for that, we want to choose actions associated with these different things. So with gallstones, you want to take an antilithic and a bitter. A herb I might want to use is gentian, so I've narrowed it down there. If there's some cramping things, I may want to use an antispasmodic or a carminative. In this case, I'll use wild yam. Uh, with bloating, I could use a carminative. 
You could also use bitters can sometimes help with that as well. So there's a list of those you might want to choose. If they have heartburn, you might want to give them a bitter and a demulcent, depending on what's going on. We'll come back to that in a second. Elevated cholesterol, there's things that help to reduce cholesterol, like an anti-hypercholesteremia. Anyway, anti-hypercholesteremic should be, but anyways, something that lowers cholesterol. Um, and I know that there's a few verbs that I might want to use, like artichoke and wild yam. I'm kind of going through this one quick, and we'll go through other ones slower, okay? And then finally, they have an inflamed liver. We want to try to protect that. Uh, we might want to use milk thistle and gentian. They both are... Uh, can help with that as well. And I didn't mention cholagog and choleretics is kind of covered in the bitters. So those are a list of signs and symptoms that need to be addressed or could be addressed. So are the actions that I want to use in this tincture that I'm forming. So a tincture is a herbal extract. And then your herbs, these are a number of things I could choose from. So in this case, what if you look on the right-hand side, now this is, I created a little application for naturopaths uh, actually, I created two things, a website and uh, a little application for them. Uh, they're two separate things. I haven't actually released this application. I'm hoping to release it like literally this week. Um, but the idea is you can choose from a pop-up list the herbs that you want to put in the formula. And then it gives the reference ranges for that. And then you can choose you know, whether you want to be in the high end or low end of that reference range. And you click the little adjust button. And it'll actually go and sort of tweak the dosages so it creates a nice, easy round value of one or one and a half teaspoons three times a day for the patient. And so uh, it'll do all your calculations for what you need to give to the patient. And then the other cool thing is it'll actually tell you how much you need to put in a bottle. So you choose your bottle size at 250 mils and then it'll do your calculation based on your reference ranges and the dose you want to give and say, look, this is how much you have to put in a bottle. And this is how long that bottle will last. So if the patient's taking 1.5 teaspoons three times a day, that's only going to last about 11 days. So um, that's not very long. Um, so you may end up having the patient take less than that. Now, normally, generally speaking, you want to take herbs in the reference ranges. There are some overlapping actions here. You could potentially go a little bit lower and still see benefits. So you might have them start with this dose or start a little lower or go up. Uh, and see what happens, okay? Uh, so, um, this little tincture calculator, I'll show you another little thing. I'm gonna, uh oh. Batteries on my keyboard are starting to die. I should have changed those. Uh, let's see if I can get. Hold on one second. Huh. Um, so another thing that I created, and you guys, I, created, I put a link there for you guys to go check this out. I have a website called ND Assist, um, and people can buy access to it for 20 bucks as a one-time fee, and then they can look at conditions and treatments. There's a bunch of research stuff there. And so the idea of what I've done is you can go and read little monographs on the herbs. And so the monographs are used to basically review what herbs you want in your formula. So here's chamomile. I kind of summarize the basic stuff and what you use it for. And then here's the indications and sort of list and point form things that you can use it for divided the system, gastrointestinal, nervous system, dermatologic. And then the actions associated with this herb, the main constituents in there. And then it'll kind of give you an idea of what the dosage is for these things. Uh, and so the pictures that you can look at, uh, if you click on the PubMed link, it'll go and do a search in PubMed for all the research articles associated with that herb. And so uh, I put a little link in where basically I have a hidden word called Bot 101, where if you go and search for it, I think there's about 35 herbs in there that um basically uh are the ones that we covered in class to make it easy so you can read this, these little descriptive monographs without having to log into the website okay um and so that makes for a really useful tool you can read about it and then the little tincture calculator is what i just showed you before 
um, that then you can go in and uh, uh, form little compounding uh, tinctures with it. Now, historically, the website was a twenty dollar fee to get into it, and then that was a one time fee. And then uh, companies advertise so I can keep your costs low. Um, and then for the app. I'm probably going to sell it for an additional 20, but I might just send it sell it to you guys for like an extra 10 bucks or something like that if you want it just as a deal for, for the students. Um, it's not a money maker to put it in perspective. I've been building this little app for uh, this little tincture calculator app for probably two years. It's been in the works, you know, part time, a little bit here, a little bit there. I had a baby, so that slowed me down. And I probably spent, I don't do all the programming, I hire someone to do all the, the math behind it, but I've been creating. Uh, um, playing with and doing it for for you know hundreds of hours, anyways, of messing around with it. Appreciate. I'll be lucky if I sell a thousand copies for twenty bucks, um, and uh, that would be great. Uh, if I sell maybe three hundred copies, four hundred copies, I would probably be able to pay for the developer. So this is not a lucrative thing for me at all. So if you want to buy these things, I'll send you a link when it's ready. I'll give the class some kind of deal with it. I haven't figured out what I'm going to do, but make sure. Try to encourage you guys to pick it up because it's going to be a really useful tool for you guys in practice. The other final thing that I didn't mention with this is that it creates a little uh, tincture label maker uh, so that you can print out the label and stick it on your uh, on your uh, bottles. And uh, and I've also created a bunch of preloaded formulas with it. So you guys will find that useful. Um, what I'm also going to do is figure out a way I can install it on the computers at college eventually so that you guys can have free access to it when you're on campus. So I think it's a great tool. Like it's, I gotta say it's pretty awesome. I can't take credit for the, the calculations are really, really complicated, but he's done a brilliant job uh, doing what I've asked him to do. So I think you guys will like that, okay? Uh, now I'll say one other thing is, it's an app that won't run on like iPhones and tablets. It's only for desktop computers just because uh, we're using software that only installs it on there. Most people are creating labels and doing all that software laptop. So it won't be on your phones, but the website you can access to your phone, but it doesn't have the picture calculator in it, okay? Um, anyways, so that's a quick little summary. I included that to give you an idea. That's sort of how my brain was working when I created some formulas coming up here. So what I'm gonna talk about is general approaches in treating gastro intestinal conditions, okay? With every single person that comes into the clinic, I get them to remove food sensitivities. And food sensitivities are pretty common. So you can do this, you can identify food sensitivities through a few different ways. You can do blood tests, they are controversial. I've used them, they're expensive. I think they're valuable for some people, but I can't justify other people for spending the, the money on them. Um, you'll find an awful lot of bad press on them. But I can tell you this, um, I use them in practice, not with every single patient at all, but for patients where it's indicated, uh, and I can't figure it out doing an elimination diet of some sort, or they just want to do it, it can sometimes be life-changing for people. Um, and sometimes, for example, when you do an elimination diet, you let people drink or eat, uh, let's say, rice or other foods that you think should be hypoallergenic. And you know, one in a hundred people are reactive to rice, but you know, they could eat gluten, you know. So it's not just gluten isn't the only sensitivity that people can have. Okay, I'll talk about that more in a second. So remove food sensitivities. Uh, I'm gonna give you the handout that I usually start with people. It's pretty easy, and it's more about you know reducing common food sensitivities uh, rather than a strict elimination of all the big ones. Because just most people, if I just get them to remove dairy, eggs, yeast, sugar. Uh, do a gluten reduce, so switch from wheat to uh, rye, they'll do much, and a few other foods like bananas remove them. They do awesome, okay? Uh, and I don't think my way is the best, but uh, I think it's pretty good for most people, and it gives me an operating system. So the first visit, I get them, uh, I get them to remove food sensitivity, get them to remove dairy, uh, sorry, uh, sugar as well, and usually give them a breakfast to eat because that's the most difficult meal to, talk, to eat for people to have. Um, the next step would be is depending on how they present, usually if I take the case, I might be meaning is the main cause of their digestive conditions, is it food sensitivities 
or is it leaning more towards possible dysbiosis? And dysbiosis just means your gut flora is messed up. And that could be a frank infection, like you go to Mexico and you get infectious diarrhea, or it could be more subtle where you might just have some, your bowel movements are off and you're not really quite sure. There's some days you're good, some days you're not. And that's more vague and it could be food or it could be a bus, okay? So in general, I often will try to stimulate digestive function with a lot of people and that helps with certain conditions. Really, really can help a lot. Often I'll give people a probiotic. Uh, definitely making sure their bowels are working properly is important. And that can relate to the food sensitivities. That can relate to not enough fiber. That could be relate to all dysbiosis with the wrong bugs in your gut as well. And then finally, you want to make sure that you relieve the symptoms that the patient's coming in with because you want to make people feel better. And so maybe your long-term goal is to figure out what's causing the constipation or what's causing the heartburn. But if they haven't had a bowel wound in a week, you want to get those bowels working ASAP to make them feel better. And then you gain their trust. So you might give them a laxative of some sort to get the things, get the bowels working, and then you figure out what the cause, long-term chronic cause of it is. Or with heartburn, you might give them demulsants to get rid of the burn, and then you figure out what could be going on, okay? So, appreciate, if you're, you know, one of the things with, with being a naturopath is I'm not just limited to being, uh, using herbs. And herbs are fantastic for digestive issues. Uh, but there are other supplements I sometimes use. I use primarily diet and some herbs with um, digestive conditions. Throw a little magnesium citrate, some probiotics, uh, and that's going to be most of what I use for digestive upset. Uh, and I sometimes will throw some other things into it as well. A little bit of glutamine occasionally and some uh, DGL. Um, but for the most part, it's these, these things, okay? So these are the main actions that you use associated with the digestive tract. We'll go through these in more detail later on. But most digestive issues, um, these are the things that you're going to use, okay? So your bitter is to promote digestion. It falls under the stomach, it's the cold ox, cold Demulsants, anytime there's any kind of inflammation or burning going on, you'd use that. Uh, laxatives or to get the bowels working, antispasmodics, comminatives to help with cramping pain, antimicrobials such as an infection, antiemetics, uh, if people have nausea. The other thing I would add to this, which I didn't do, you know what, you should probably do this. Uh, just to add in. Anti ulcer, all right. Add in vulnerary. See that there as well. Uh, powder protective. I think that's most of them. Sorry, I'm still making some of these, tweaking some of these slides, but uh, it's a work in progress. So. Those are your herbal actions. Now, I also, I just added these for you guys this year. Here's a handout that I give my patients. Almost every single person on the first visit, almost, not everyone, gets what we call the red flag foods. And this is something my wife has developed over the years. Um, one thing I've done is I've, uh, let me see if I can pull it up here. I don't know if I have it on my, maybe my, nah, I don't have it on here, perhaps. Um, so one thing I've done is, because we've run the IgG food sensitivity test well over a thousand times between my wife and I, um, I take all that data and I put it into a database that I've created that we have the average report for hundreds of people that are in the database. So we know what the most common food sensitivities are. One, just from the experience, you start to know like what the common ones are, but we can also make kind of a list of foods for people to avoid based on some evidence. You know, it's, it's 
Um, there is some debate on the validity of the test and a number of other things, but you know what? It's pretty useful. So before I get people to order the test, I always say, look, just avoid these common food tolerances and see how you do. So sugar, sugar is a number of, does a number of things for your gut. One, I find that a lot of people with reflux, that they eat a lot of sugar. I think sweet things relax the lower esophageal sphincter, causing reflux, and bitter things tighten it up. Um, also, if you eat sugar, it tends to aggravate uh, bloating. Eat a lot of sugar, it gets fermented in your gut. You just get a lot of flatulence. Also, it can feed certain bugs that may like it for diarrhea or other bugs that may cause uh, you know, inflammation in the gut or some kind of immune reaction. So you're going to feed your yeast in the gut or other kind of bugs. So I always get people to remove all sugar on the first visit. Honey and maple syrup, they are good for you if you have very small amounts. But again, I get people to avoid that. Fruit juice, again, is pretty concentrated with sugar. I'm not a big fan of artificial sweeteners or even the natural artificial sweeteners. They still fool your body and do releasing insulin, and they're not really great for you know, weight loss. But a little bit of stevia and xylitol uh, is permitted. I think they're better than most of them out there. It's hard to avoid these altogether. And there are benefits of using something like stevia for uh, because it doesn't uh, feed, let's say, yeast overgrowth in the gut or other bugs. Okay? So sugar, good people to avoid that. And often, I mean, that's just good advice in general okay uh and it can all help lower the risk of heart disease diabetes cancer everything you know so it's good for a million things dairy is probably uh one of the worst food sensitivities so the number one food intolerance is the whey component in cow's milk and the number two intolerance uh is eggs the egg white so when it comes to milk you have the curds and the whey the curds make cheese the whey component is what's separated from the, the curds uh, when they make cheese and it used to be thrown in the garbage now they put it in the bottles and they sell the weight lifters i'm not a big fan of dairy in general although i love cheese uh but the weight component is what really bugs people um some people are so sensitive that even a little bit of like a spoonful of milk or cream in their coffee can upset them uh sometimes children like my wife when she was nursing our daughter if she had a little bit of milk in her tea it would cause my daughter's stool to turn green and she'd become colicky and not poop for a day. And you wouldn't believe it, but it probably happened. So my opinion, dairy is not good for you, period. Okay. Yes, it has macronutrients in it and calcium, all this stuff, but you don't need to be drinking milk. You know, there's research that shows that it increases risk for breast cancer and prostate cancer. There's research that doesn't show that, but it's really hard because I think Industry funded research can drown out uh, research that shows negative effects, and so it's hard to really, you know, form a strong opinion. I think in general, eating a lot of dairy in any form is not good for people, regardless if you have a food sensitivity. Cheese is high in saturated fats; it's high in proteins that uh, are not linked to longevity. You know that you know are linked to heart disease, uh, lots of skin issues, digestive issues. So. I eat cheese because I love it, but I try to limit it, how much I eat. And when you look at countries like France, where they eat a lot of dairy products, they're not eating like cheese on everything. They have small amounts of fancy cheeses that are, uh, you know, strong flavored. So they're not eating like huge amounts in one sitting. Uh, and they tend not to overeat as well. Uh, but generally speaking, definitely the research shows limiting your dairy is going to be good for overall health. And with regards to food sensitivities, whey protein, yogurt, sour cream, ice cream, those ones are the big ones. I find most people can tolerate cheese in general. If they don't tolerate cow cheese, then I usually tell them to go with more goat cheap cheeses if they want them, or even buffalo cheeses. Okay, so like buffalo mozzarella or goat cheap cheeses, uh, you can find them that you can find all the most of those in cheddar and mozzarella things that are uh, uh, you know, tend not have a strong um, goatee or sheep taste to it okay so there's a few different alternatives so watch read the ingredients processed foods bad in general because they dump lots of sugar and dairy into them they figure out a way to get this in and boost up the protein uh egg whites are a huge food intolerance for a lot of people i find a big link for heartburn and a lot of different types of digestive upset uh and some people it slows the bowels down other people it speeds it up uh causes burping so Get people to avoid those. 
Uh, also, if you don't believe me that eggs aren't good for you, there's a study that came out showing three eggs a day increases all-cause mortality. That's uh, heart disease, cancer, and a number of other things. And one thing that dairy and eggs have in it uh, is they're rich in an amino acid called methionine. So they have saturated fats, they have cholesterol, and then they also have this thing called methionine, which is an essential amino acid. And there is uh, research showing um, diets that are basically deficient or low in methionine, even though it's an essential uh, nutrient, uh, it tends to be associated with longevity. And so the methionine activates certain genes. So I think when you're younger, doing things that contain methionine is different than when you're older. So the older you get, you gotta be more careful. So I think that the amino acid composition, specifically in animal proteins and dairy and eggs as well, uh, is completely different than vegetable-based proteins and the vegetable-based proteins have health benefits, you know? And you're gonna see more and more research coming out on the benefits of a whole food plant-based diet. And I think that's what we all should be striving for. Even if you eat meat, dairy and eggs, eating lots of plant-based proteins and fruits and vegetables is good, okay? Uh, uh, Laura's asked me if I limit carbs that are easily digestible. I kind of watch it. Flowers definitely don't help people. We'll come back to that in a second, though, okay? Uh, Caitlin's asking, doesn't sugar alcohols like xylitol uh, irritate the gut? Um, they can get fermented by your gut flora. I don't think they irritate it from like an inflammatory standpoint. I think it's more that some of the gut bacteria will ferment it. That's why I'm like saying lim very limited amounts. I prefer a stevia, but xylitol does have some uh, benefits to it. It's not the worst thing, but some people do react to it. So, uh, again, when I'm creating this list, it's not just for gut issues. So I might talk about xylitol say, just don't overdo that because it might cause a little bit of burping or, or extra bloating and gas. Uh, so Adam's saying that he thinks that, um, uh, yolks would be worse than the whites from the IgG food testing standpoint. So you can't see this, so I don't know, but the average, so for the hundreds of people that I've tested, the egg white comes in at around 75, the egg yolk comes in around 20 for the average person. And so I think the yolks have more cholesterol, they have more other things in it, but the whites seem to be the things that bug people. So I know a lot of people that can eat maybe a little bit of the egg white and they can eat all the yolks without having any issues with it. That being said, the yolks do have more cholesterol, have other things in it, and we can get into the debate about the effects of cholesterol uh, on heart disease and whether dietary effects matter, uh, but we won't go there right now, okay? Yeast is a big thing in the diet that bugs a lot of people. So beer, kombucha, apple cider, and leavened bread. So breads that rise tend to bug a lot of people. So often when people have an issue with bread, it can be the type of grain that it's made with, or it could be the yeast component in it. So I usually get people to recommend yeast-free breads like the Benthamire rye breads. This is a rye-based bread, which is lower in gluten and doesn't have any yeast in it. And uh, so it has a lower glycemic index and people tolerate it better. That would not be tolerated, tolerated or allowed on a diet called the FODMAP diet because it's rye. But anyways, I don't use the FODMAP diet very much. And I also like Kamut uh, as an alternative for wraps. So you can get these uh, for pizzas and quesadillas and fajitas and all that kind of stuff, sandwiches. Uh, we use, these are the two things that we usually buy for grains, um, generally speaking. And these wraps are lower in gluten as well and don't have yeast in it. Uh, you got to read the labels on things. Lots of things have yeast in it as well. When it comes to bread, wheat that's used to make bread is different than the wheat used to make pasta. One is germ wheat and the other one is whatever dwarf wheat is. I find that wheat in bread, along with yeast, bugs a lot of people. If you switch over to rye and go gluten-free, most people do much better on that. Now, if you're celiac, you can't do that. But I generally recommend a gluten-reduced diet. So avoid wheat and barley seem to be the two big ones that bug people. Corn, which is gluten-free, also bugs a lot of people. So going gluten-free doesn't always work for people. Sourdough is often better tolerated. Uh, the Denfelmeyer rye bread is a sourdough rye bread, and it's good for diabetes and, you know, in moderation. Uh, durum wheat pasta, it's in my caution. I'm fine doing that, 
and sometimes the gluten free is worse, but some people can't do that. So, you know, you may have to go totally gluten free. So I like the low gluten grains like the kamut and the rye. Uh, and you might be able to go totally gluten free. That would be amaranth, buckwheat, rice, quinoa, oats, things like that. Nuts and seeds uh, usually are okay. Sometimes various nuts can bug people. Uh, I kind of have to tweak this on my own. One big thing I get everyone to avoid is pea-based protein powder. I had one woman who came up with colitis. She had an impeccable diet. She made vegan shakes every morning with pea-based protein. Uh, she was on medication for colitis, had bowel wounds all the time, and blood, and mucus. I removed that one thing from her diet. She was cured from it. So most people have moved away from soy-based protein powders into pea. I have no issues with soy for most people if it's non-GMO. Uh, I also try to encourage people to eat in general, more nuts and seeds and legumes to try to get more plant-based protein in. So black beans, mung beans, and lentils are usually well tolerated. If you use one of these little pressure cookers, they tend to help as well. And then finally with fruit, I get people to avoid bananas, dried fruit, even though I like a little bit, but dried fruit because it's high in sugar. Uh, bananas tend to be bloating and constipating. Uh, pineapples and melons limit the amount of cherries and grapes because they're concentrating sugar and gear more towards uh, oranges and, and uh, sorry, uh, berries and some citrus is, is good and a few other things, okay? So you don't need to know this for the exam, I want to say, but this is just what I go through with every patient. And then people are like, well, what am I going to eat for breakfast? This is the breakfast recipe as a base that I give people. They grind up flax, chia, mix them together with hemp. So I use a little coffee grinder, grind flax, chia once a week, add the hemp in, keep it in the fridge so it doesn't go rancid. And then you get your fruit out. If it's frozen, you add hot water to it. You add your seeds to it. It'll turn into a porridge or you can blend it. If it's fresh, you just sprinkle it on dry. You can add a little bit of milk, nut beverage or nut milk to it if you want to or soy milk. Um, you can add a little cinnamon to it if you like the taste of that. And that's the main breakfast that I give people. It's a magic thing that basically is rich in omega-3s, low in omega-6s. High in anthocyanins from the berries, high in lignans from the flax, helps reduce the risk of breast cancer, prostate cancer, rich in fiber, which everyone needs more fiber. It's completely vegetable based, so there's no animal products in it. So that's one meal a day. Uh, you're at least being vegan. Not that I, you know, being vegan is not necessarily a good thing if you're eating vegan french fries and Coca Cola and stuff, but uh, lowers the risk for all sorts of things. So this is. The magic breakfast that people want to, they can make it as a shake. I have a little soy protein to it. I often will add other spices and vegetables and kale and spinach and whatever else, but it's it's pretty magic. So, uh, so I hope you all eat some version of this. Uh, someone's asking the two products I like is Kamut Wraps and the Nymphomyer Rye Bread. Those are usually, uh, they work for me and most people, not everyone. So, again, you're silly, I can't do that. And again, occasionally someone reacts to flax seeds, you know, it's like maybe one in 50. So this is not a good breakfast for them or chia day. Some people react to that. Uh, walnuts and hemp are usually pretty good though, okay? And if they do react to this, then it gives you some clues that maybe there's something else going on. You got to factor that in. But this is great for most people and they like it. Some people get bored of it uh, because they're used to eating you know, junk food for breakfast. You know, it's hard to compete against chocolate chip muffins and, uh, you know, a triple, triple coffee in the morning. And I'm saying drink a coffee black and eat fruit, nuts, and seeds. They call it bird food, some of them, but uh, that bird food's good for you. Uh, will you be posting the lecture slides on Moodle? This is posted on Moodle, isn't it? Guys? I posted it. Uh... It is posted, thanks. Sorry, I posted this morning, um, not last night. Uh, so that may be why you didn't find it, sorry about that. Uh, it's called GI Conditions. Okay, a little bit. Uh, okay. First condition we'll talk about is indigestion. Uh, so indigestion is basically, it means you got discomfort when you're eating. The scientific or medical term for it is dyspepsia, okay? So this, everybody can get indigestion. So if you overeat 
uh, one particular thing, like you just eat too much fat or you eat over eat in general, you just eat twice as big a serving size as you should, that can be a cause of it. Food sensitivity is often an issue. Also, if your digestive tract is sluggish, you need to stimulate it. So that can be an issue. And then finally, sometimes if you have certain bugs in your system, when you eat, that can cause you discomfort and pain. So if you had like an H. pylori infection, that could be a cause of indigestion, right? You get some heartburn, bloating, because the H. pylori can affect your stomach acid and also affect your mucosa. Also, yeast overgrowth in the gut uh, can affect a lot of people as well, okay? So it could be any a number of different symptoms. You have just heaviness, doing full, you're burping, you get a little bit of reflux or GERD, uh, GERD going on. We'll talk about that after because that's a separate issue on its own. Uh, and then nausea might go along with it. So I think everyone's overeaten at some point in their life and it feels, you know, you go for all you can eat sushi and you don't think it should hurt you. But if you eat enough tempura, yeah, you feel pretty awful, right? So uh, I tend not to eat. Good advice is only eat to 80% of your stomach or 70% of your stomach's capacity. Uh, that's one way to live a long time and feel healthy and not overburden the system, okay? Now in herbal medicine, Sometimes people can develop what's called atonic digestion. And what this means is you eat normal meals and you just lack digestive tone. We, I've mentioned this before. So it's like your digestive tract is lazy. You may have associated what's called hypochlorhydria, so low stomach acid. So you're not releasing enough digest, digestive juices to break the food down effectively. So it basically sits in your stomach and makes you feel crummy. So what do you do? You know, in this case, um, you gotta get digestion working better. And a lot of reasons can cause this atonic digestion. It can be if you're eating a diet that's very sweet and avoid of bitter foods. Also, if you're eating on the run, uh, you know, you don't have all those cues associated with digestion uh, with uh, eating meals. So if you're eating a fast food in your car on the way to a meeting or something, you know, it may not, your body may not notice that you're eating so to speak. And so the food hasn't primed the digestive tract as well as it could. So it just sort of sits there and feels heavy. Also, if you're sick or you're old, um, those are situations where digestive function may be diminished for some reason. So you may have to stimulate it. So stress, illness, drugs are all associated with it. Uh, so atonic digestion, in addition, if you're just not digesting your food, your bowels will be a little more sluggish and you may develop gallstones because the bile is not pumping out and you might get a little bit of reflux because food's sitting in your stomach, the sphincter's not tightening up sufficiently and then you get that reflux going on, okay? So what are the symptoms? Low appetite, you could have nausea as well with it. Uh, heaviness, burping, bloating, maybe heartburn. The heartburn, if it kind of comes and goes or if it's kind of low grade, that would be all good signs of that. Now there's other causes for these things, but this is just one example. So in digestion or dyspepsia in general, you want to remove the food sensitivity. So if someone came and said, oh, I don't know, I got, I think I've got some digestive issues, I feel bloated, my bowels are a little sluggish, I get a little bit of heartburn sometimes, you know, there's, everything's kind of vague, then I would remove the common food sensitivity, see how they do, maybe give them a little bit of a digestive bitter, okay? Um, and the bitters will help to stimulate digestion and improve their appetite, generally speaking. If they're getting heartburn, I might give them a demulcent, or I might not, it depends uh, how severe it is. Uh, if people are stressed, then you gotta work on stress management and uh, help them uh, to be more relaxed and mindful, especially when they're eating. Going to the gym can also probably indirectly help your digestion. Uh, also improve your eating habits. So sitting at a table, maybe saying grace before dinner or, or a prayer or whatever, you know, or just, a, you know, being aware that you're sitting down. I'm not a religious person, but uh, we always say uh, grace for dinner just because I like the ritual of it. And I think it brings everyone together. It's nice. Um, also, um, you know, when people are cooking food at home rather than, you know, eating on the run, you also get to you know, the food is being prepared, you smell the food, you know, there's all this ritual associated with it, which I think are great cues for getting digestion to start flowing, because you don't just start digesting the food when you put it in your mouth, it started, you know, 
30 minutes or an hour before when you're preparing food or you're seeing the food being prepared or you're, you know, whatever the ritual is around that, okay? Uh, and then you may want to reduce nausea by using food or herbs that improve digestion or actually have an anti-emetic effect, okay? So these are the actions that you might use for indigestion. And I've given a few examples of herbs. This isn't extensive. I mean, this is just a few things. So digestive bitters in general. Gentian is one of my go-tos. That's my favorite one. Or one I sometimes use it uh, as well. Uh, people don't always like the taste. Barber is uh, fine. I don't use the isoquinoline alkaloid containing bitters as much as I use gentian and wormwood. Uh, only because some of those compounds are worried that there could be some safety concern taking them long term. Um, sometimes the alkaloids have a tendency to slip between DNA molecules and have a carcinogenic effect. And I don't know if that's the case or not, but I worry about berberine. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm, don't need to. Also, some of the barberry uh, herbs related to barberry have been shown to have some problems on the heart, like the chelidonium. So I limit that too. Uh, Carminatives, these can help. Uh, they can sometimes make indigestion worse depending on if you've overeaten and you are getting a little bit of reflux, but in general, they can uh, help relax sphincters, get food to descend, um, and increase circulation to warm up the gut. You just don't want to take a lot of carminatives right before bed, though, because that can cause reflux. Demulsants would help if there's a heartburn component to it, and then antiemetics may also help. Um, as well, you know, ginger is your classic one, okay? So here's a woman that came in, she's an older woman. It's a pretty simple case. She's an Italian woman, she's got lots of bloating and abdominal pain, she's got poor appetite, heaviness after meals, sometimes she gets heartburn, uh, general bloating gas, she's got some arthritis going on, she's not taking any medication for that, which is important because it could be that ibuprofen or aspirin could be causing a lot of her problems. So she has just general indigestion or dyspepsia due to probably atonic digestion, food sensitivities, and a little bit of reflux, which is tying into the food and the atonic digestion. Uh, more than likely, a little bit of lactose intolerant. And one of the things that she was doing is she was drinking milk every day. And so with her, we removed milk on the first visit, and her pain was an 8 out of 10. It improved dramatically between the first and second visit. Then I gave her gentian because I, was, I kind of didn't do the whole red flag food with her because she's older. I was just trying to like find those one or two main foods that I thought would be an issue with her uh, because it's harder to change. You know, when you're older, they've got more set in their ways. You don't want to disrupt her life too much and her English wasn't great. So we kept it simple, remove only milk because that was the main thing I thought that she was eating daily that could be bugging her. And there was that improvement. And then I gave her the digestive bitter. I just gave her gentian alone, kept it simple, had, had her take a few uh, um, drops of it, encouraged her to eat more fiber-rich foods. And you can see, basically, her abdominal pain completely resolved. And she had this for months and months and months before coming in to see me. And we basically cured her with just a very simple thing. And then her use of gentian would kind of come and go, depending on, uh, you know, she wasn't as religious as she was at first a little bit. But that's a good Simple example, I didn't meet, use a formula, just one single herb and remove one food and you can see the results. Nice, easy case, okay? Now, another thing that I did when I was working at the college for the research department, uh, we created a database that's no longer in use there because students complain it's too much work. But anyways, we got students to basically track symptoms using uh, a handle called a MyMop scale. And the MyMop was a research tool they had a scale from not to zero to 10, but zero to six. And six is the worst and zero is non-existent. And what I did was I went through the database with the students' uh, cases and looked at all the students that were taking bitter herbs for indigestion. So anyone who had indigestion that fit the criteria that we were using. And they may have been doing other things in addition to the, digest uh, to the digestive bitters. But you can see the general trend is when people have indigestion, if you give them bitter herbs, and some of these people also had dietary change, most of them had dietary changes, probiotics, glutamine, apple cider vinegar, fiber supplement, the trend is they got better. But this guy here at the top there in uh, turquoise, 
they got better, but they plateaued, you know? So they may have gotten 30% better, but they didn't get 100% better, and that's presumably because they also didn't address the other possible causes of the symptoms associated with indigestion. And maybe they didn't give um, uh, something for their heartburn or constipation or whatever it is. Uh, so appreciate herbs are only one aspect. The bitters can help. But not all these people went down to zero. You know, some of them did. Some of them I didn't. You know, this is after 60 days. My personal patients I usually see within a month, month and a half. I would hope that all these patients should be, 80% of my patients should be at a zero. Um, but I can't comment specifically on all these cases because they weren't my patients. But those are student cases. Uh, so, Harper. Heartburn is just a symptom. It basically just means you've got a burning sensation in the center of your chest, okay? And you can basically have heartburn where it's affecting the esophagus. And so acid is bubbling up in the esophagus uh, and irritating it. And that's called gastroesophageal reflux disorder. Or if it's just occasional, it would just be called gastroesophageal reflux. So just GER, not GER, uh, So a little bit of reflux can be an issue. Or it could be affecting the stomach. And if it's affecting the stomach, with heartburn, it's not an issue, generally speaking, that your stomach's not making enough acid. It's usually it ends up in the wrong place. So with if it's affecting your esophagus, it's usually it's called esophagitis because there's inflammation in the esophagus, and that's usually due to GERD. If it's affecting the stomach, it's either because you're not making enough mucus, because... Um, you're taking certain anti-inflammatory drugs or too much alcohol, uh, or it could be an infection. Uh, H. pylori uh, compromises the mucosal, like the barrier that coats the inner stomach. So that's the reason why your stomach doesn't get heartburn, generally speaking, even if you're, my stomach's probably at a pH of two right now, and it would you know, eat through nails if I put one in my stomach. But the reason why it doesn't affect my, my, my actual stomach walls is because there's that mucus there. And so uh, H. pylori will compromise that and uh, also directly infect the stomach and cause damage to it. Uh, and then finally, stress decreases circulation to the stomach because of the redirection of blood flow uh, and does a number of other things that basically compromises circulation and uh, mucus formation in the stomach. And that can also lead to ulcer formations or just heartburn in general, uh, and probably also a little bit of the esophageal issue as well, okay? So in general, how do you treat heartburn? For me, again, I always try to remove food sensitivities. Carminatives, any herbs that are spicy, rich in essential oils, they will cause the lower esophageal sphincter to relax, okay? But other foods like eggs and dairy and things, uh, the way that they can cause uh, food sensitivities, one, they could directly irritate the mucous membranes if you had some kind of sensitivity, and it could be mediated by an IgG response, which is kind of a, uh, what most food sensitivities are, or it could be an allergic reaction even, uh, causing like uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, you'll learn about that later on. In general, you got to remove the foods. Different people have different sensitivities. Dairy and eggs, one way that they could affect it is it just food sits in the stomach longer, pressure builds up, and then you get reflux. Other people could be caffeine, uh, chocolate. There's other foods that can affect it beyond just an immune-mediated one as well, okay? And again, at least, uh, the uh, carminatives as well. So you want to increase the sphincter tone, and that can be done using herbs like the bitters, but also just reducing the volume of food that you eat. Also, uh, not eating when you're stressed out. Um creating more routine, that's all going to support that sphincter tone. Uh, and avoiding drugs that can release, release that sphincter tone as well. You want to promote digestion by sitting down, chewing your food, taking digestive bitters, things like that. You might want to increase mucus production. That could be taking a demulcent, either uh, as a marshmallow or slippery elm or licorice. You may need to reduce stomach acid. Generally speaking, I don't like to do that. There are acid-blocking drugs and herbs that will do that for you. In rare cases, you might have to eradicate H. pylori infection. Um, there are drugs that do that, antibiotics, but they don't always work. So sometimes I, I end up treating an H. pylori infection because 
the doctors, they got to wait too long to see the specialists or the doctors have already tried and it's come back or whatever it may be. And then finally, in severe cases, there could be an actual bleeding ulcer of some sort. And the kind of approach you might take with that is going to be a little bit different than you would if you just have the occasional heartburn or very mild heartburn, okay? So, if you have no idea what you're doing and someone comes with heartburn, I would say the first thing you probably want to do is give a demulcent because you can never go wrong. If you want to play it cautious, not take any risk, give them licorice or DGL. If they have high blood pressure, don't give them licorice, give them DGL. Or get them to drink a, a tea or an extract of marshmallow and slippery on or do the combinations. So depending on how much discomfort they're in, if they're having heartburn all the time, you could just give them a DGL or some marshmallow licorice tea or slippery elm capsule, however you want to give it. And hopefully by the next visit, they're going to be feeling dramatically better. So that was, you know, the first visit you may have removed some common food sensitivities along with the demulcents. Now you might want to give them bitters. I often will give bitters uh, to people when they have heartburn. But this is sort of a cautionary watch out because depending on the type of heartburn they have, it could make it worse. If they have gastritis, which is inflammation of the stomach due to some kind of infection, it'll definitely make it worse uh, if you give bitters alone. So I've had a couple of cases where I've, I'm, I've included, they don't make me look good, but these aren't common things that happen, but I have aggravated people with bitters and I'll show you at least one case. Antacids, I don't use these routinely, but where I would use them again if you had an also a really bad inflammation going on, you might throw a herb like meadowsweet, which is a great herb for heartburn if you're trying to lower that stomach acid, and then combine it with licorice and marshmallow and a few other things to have that nice soothing coating effect. Um, and you might even throw some chamomile, which turns out it does have some antacid effects as well. While you heal, get things to heal up better, and then you can, you know, it buys you a little bit of time because you want to make that patient feel better, okay? Astringents I use rarely. So this would be more in a severe case where I need to have a suppress suppressive action. And so Cranesville, if they had an active GI ulcer, ga uh, gastric ulcer, I might use Cranesville. Oak and witch hazel are also fine to use as well. I just usually use more of the Cranesville. I don't know why. It's just sort of the collective doctors used it more for digestive stuff, so I, I, I like using it. And then finally, there's a whole slew of antimicrobials you might need to use if you're treating an H. pylori infection, okay? Uh, so someone's asking, would I not recommend Tums? I, I don't have any strong feelings against Tums. Tums is an antacid that basically, uh, it's like baking soda that neutralizes stomach acid. So if someone needs to take it occasionally for heartburn and it works for them, I don't really care. I mean, um, Long term, I want to get them off that. Tums is probably one of the most benign things that, as far as quote unquote drugs go, that someone could take. The worst would be the proton pump inhibitors, then the H2 blockers, and then Tums. So the proton pump inhibitors and H2 blockers are both uh, acid suppressing drugs. Uh, the PPIs, so the proton pump inhibitors, they'll suppress it by greater than 90%. Uh, so that you have no stomach acid. The H2 blockers are not as effective, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because they're not quite as strong. So you still can preserve some digestive function, but reduce it. Uh, yeah, as antax PPI. So heartburn GERD. So with gastroesophageal reflux disorder or even occasional reflux, um, this is not because the person has too much stomach acid, it's the problem is that the acid's not staying in the stomach. It's moving into the esophagus. And this could be due to poor esophageal sphincter that separates the esophagus from the stomach. Uh, also, if you just overeat, you build up the pressure inside the stomach, then what that means is that poor esophageal sphincter has to work even harder. And if you have something like a hiatal hernia where part of the stomach kind of balloons up above the diaphragm or... Uh, maybe there's some anatomical reasons why that sphincter is not closing. Maybe there's some scarring or whatever it may be. Uh, those are examples where, 
you know, it might be a little bit harder to treat. But in general, with most people with the GERD, it's usually because uh, basically food's not going down and your digestive tract isn't being stimulated. And it's often related to uh, certain spicy foods. But sometimes taking spicy foods, if you take a digestive bitter, it'll counteract the effects of the spicy foods. Also, if you lay down at night, uh, right after you've eaten, so you overeat close to bedtime, people will get heartburn or reflux at night before they go to bed. Uh, melatonin can help with that as an aside. Um, also, uh, so that's gravity working against you. Fatty foods, fat and too much protein tends to make things sit in the stomach too long. That's an issue. And then certain drugs like bisphosphonates can also have an issue. The main symptoms of GERD would be, uh, or reflux, is going to be heartburn. But you can also get other weird things like asthma and chronic coughs, okay? So in this case, you've got to identify the foods, increase the lower esophageal sphincter. I know this is repetitive, but that's okay. Promote digestion, protect the mucus lining. So DGL can help, but you might want to get some. DGL increases mucus production, but you've got more of these mucus secreting cells in your stomach than you do in your esophagus. So... Um, if someone doesn't respond to the DGL, you might want to try marshmallow or slippery on and just have them drink that extra mucilage, right? Which would be better. Uh, you may have to raise the head of the bed, get them not to lay down right after they've eaten, and then avoid overeating, okay? Again, carminatives like ginger, fennel, anise, spicy foods, cayenne, things like that, uh, they can aggravate it as well. So, demulcents, liquors, marshmallow, slippery on, bitters, Antacids, acutely you could use meadow sweet, but again, you could use tongue, but not probably against using that. And then your di dietary changes in general, okay? So here's, uh, who is this? Oh yes, I just added this one. This one's kind of complicated. Here's a woman, she came in with gallstones. Now we're gonna do gallstone cases in more detail later on, but uh, heartburn and reflux and IBS, they often all go together. So she had gallstones, her largest one was 1.7 centimeters in size. She got cramping pain under her upper right quadrant, underneath her ribs. She also had heartburn and it's been flaring up just recently where she got a lot of burning in the chest. She gets some nausea. Uh, I didn't mention, oh, there it is, nausea. Uh, sometimes you get regurgitation right into her mouth uh, and that's that GERD thing going on. And she got it daily and it was pretty severe, like a 10 out of 10. And the drugs did help. But she'd end up vomiting bile, so she's like, yeah, I don't want to take those. Now, she ate a lot of sugar, which is, is also problematic. She's addicted to sugar, okay? In addition, she had IBS, so she had digestive issues, constipation, diarrhea. IBS is just like weird bowels, so that's all it means. And so that's what she came in with. Now, she was more coming in primarily for the gallstones, but I'm going to talk about her heartburn because I haven't been treating her. I'm still seeing her. I just saw her last week. Um, and so her assessment is gallstones and she probably had the gallstones and reflux secondary to atonic digestion and food sensitivities. We didn't know if she had H. pylori. I was kind of concerned because her symptoms were so bad that she might. So I told her to go get a breath test done. It's a way to measure if she has active H. pylori because she had it in the past, but I guess they cleared it. Uh, Irritable bowel syndrome, the A is for alternating constipation and diarrhea. Uh, food sensitivity, and she also had hand swelling. Just as an aside, when we improved her diet and everything, that hand swelling all went away, which is cool. So, the first visit removed uh, red flag foods, gave her the healthy breakfast that I showed you, took her to take some DGL. It helped, but it didn't try to get rid of it, so it was more reflux. I got her to drink some chamomile in case there's some inflammation going on. Uh, kind of help heal any kind of ulcers because I didn't know what was going on. Then I gave her gentian, globe artichoke, wild jam, and ginger. Okay, and the reason why is the gentian is digestive tonic. Uh, I was also wanting to uh, reduce the cholesterol, uh, dissolve the gallstones, and I put ginger in there because I wanted to decrease the nausea. And it also has some hepatoprotective effects, and it's a cold dog. It also works on the liver. Uh, can also help with cramping pain. I thought it would be a good idea, uh, but it wasn't, I'll tell you in a second. Uh, and if we skip ahead, so the first visit, her reflux was a 10 out of 10, her GERD was, and she took the tincture I gave her, but she said it made her reflux worse. 
uh, and like when she lay down is really bad. And that's because of the carminative action of the ginger. And I kind of, sometimes when you put ginger in tinctures, it can make it really, really spicy. And I think I'll admit I made a mistake there. I shouldn't have given it to her, even though it would help with the earth. You know, it would help with so many things that she has going on, but it aggravated her uh, reflux. Ginger even has a, a bit of an antacid effect to it as well, just as an aside. But, and sometimes when you give it with a bitter, they'll, the bitter will help to tighten that tincture up. Anyways, she did not do well with the tincture. And, you know, I can't believe she took it for two weeks, even though it made things, at the very least, the same, but potentially even worse. Then what I did was I switched out the ginger and switched it for licorice to get more of a demulsion action. And um, also gave her melatonin at night. And you can see, last time I saw her, oh, that was, sorry, my dates aren't right because I was trying to get this done last night. Um, I forgot to do that. So about a month and a half later, her reflux is almost entirely gone. That tincture is working great for her now. We've removed the food sensitivity she's off, the sugar that's helping. Her bowels are normal and her cramping in the upper right quadrant is essentially gone. Uh, maybe a little bit here and there, but... Uh, that's what we did, and we ruled out the H. pylori, and which is good. So I didn't have to treat treat the stomach also. Okay. So the reason why I included this case was I kind of made a mistake by throwing the ginger in the formula. It's pretty spicy, and I don't even normally do that. I don't know why I did that, but uh, I kind of I thought it would do more good than harm, but I was wrong in that case. Okay. Now here's another case of a woman. She came in with a chronic cough, so she had this dry chronic cough with post-nasal drip, and she didn't have any heartburn. But often, gastroesophageal reflux disorder causes heartburn, but it could be silent. You may not even get that. And one of the problems is that the nerves that innervate the esophagus are the same nerves that innervate the uh, diaphragm and, and part of the respiratory tract. And so, just like when you have a heart attack, you can feel it in your arm. When people get a little bit of reflux, it may not be too bad, so they don't actually feel the burning sensation, but it's enough to irritate the esophagus and triggers a reflux cough in uh, the lungs. So some people with chronic coughs and post-nasal drip, it's just that they're irritating the esophagus and the lungs are thinking there's an irritant there, so it, it responds by coughing. And I think sometimes with post-nasal drip, um, your body's making more mucus to combat the irritation and it happens to be up in the sinuses and so they're swallowing and clearing their throat and coughing. Um, so we gave her gentian and we also gave her a tea with four parts marshmallow, one part licorice. Tastes nice, easy to take and just told her to make a big batch and drink it throughout the day. And then got her to remove those red flag foods. And then you can see the cough pretty much resolved uh, after the... Uh, Second, uh, by the second visit, post nasal drip improved, uh, and she's still much better. I've seen her again since. I can't remember what the DS stood for last night when I was laying in bed, so I couldn't update this, but she's doing a lot better. Okay, uh, Okay, any questions or we'll take a break now? Um, uh, so someone's asking, what do I think of the blood type diet? Um, I think any diet that you experiment with and you feel better doing it, then Continue to do the things that make you feel better doing it. Okay, I don't. I don't believe. I think my opinion on the blood type diet is uh, a lot of people, including naturopaths, don't have a lot of faith in the blood type diet. The science behind this is basically doing a, a studies on blood mixed in a petri dish, and I think from my experience, with having done blood tests on thousands of people, um, and the majority of those people are usually blood type O because that's what it is. 
you can't simply it's not individualized enough is there something to it i don't really know there could be some trends that they see uh but i would be very cautious i know i'm blood type o and i'm you know they say blood type o should be eating lots of meat and avoiding certain things i don't think eat, eating a lot of meats is a healthy thing i mean i feel I think it's, we know that eating lots of meat and dairy and stuff like that is not, and I'm supposed to be able to eat that, but we know that it's just not good for heart disease and cancer. So I don't agree with that. I know a lot of people with food sensitivities um, that they come in, they're supposed to be vegetarians according to blood type diet. And, um, you know, they test positive to legumes on their food sensitivity testing and it causes all sorts of bloating. So I would take it with a grain of salt. I don't, I don't use it. I don't believe in it. If you remove something and you feel better, great. Um, again, when I'm creating my list of foods for people to avoid, some people can eat, drink milk and eat eggs, like for sure. Like it doesn't, it's just because I tell people not to do it doesn't mean that uh, it, it bothers, it bothers everyone. And some people, they can't eat rice, you know? So it's, it's hard to, you have to make it individualized. That's all I'm saying. If you want to use it as an experiment, but I wouldn't get overly, um, I, 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 the science is, is pretty debatable. And, and I think I'm not the only one who feels that way. Okay. Uh, but if you like them, you got some benefit, you know, whatever you think. Um, so the reason a man is asking why ginger isn't good, ginger is a carminative and it has a relaxing effect on sphincters. So both turmeric and ginger and fennel anise, a cayenne, um, it just has that relaxing effect on sphincters in the body, which can help food to descend, but if food's sitting, it helps it go up. Okay. So if I've had cancer patients who have been drinking a lot of ginger tea for the nausea and they're laying down, they can get reflux from it. Okay. It does have some antacid effects, but it, in this case, it just, it just was too, it just relaxed those sphincters too much. Okay. So just like if you were to take too much spicy foods that are high in cayenne and stuff okay so ginger has a warning because it's a carminative and all carminatives will have that same warning uh, okay so we'll take a quick break and then we'll come back and we'll do a bunch more cases okay so we'll see you in uh, at 11 
We back on. Uh, let's go up here. So we've got a lot of stuff we're going to get through here. Uh, here, I'm going to get... It's my birthday today. So I keep getting all these messages. People wish me happy birthday, which is lovely. I'm not complaining. But I don't want to come through my lectures because some of my friends, I don't know what... Uh, they could be joking about things that would be totally inappropriate to come up on the lecture. Not that inappropriate, but you know how friends can be. Or just saying, calling me old or something. But anyways. Um, okay. Well, thank you for the birthday wishes from you guys. Okay. So, heartburn, another thing, gastritis and ulcers. So gastritis, anytime you see itis after something, it means inflammation. So gastritis is inflammation of the stomach. Esophagitis is inflammation of the esophagus. So generally speaking, peptic ulcers, uh, which can be uh, basically stomach ulcers, usually caused by drugs or H. pylori, uh, sometimes stress, sometimes steroids. The symptoms are like things we talked about already. We basically get heartburn, that burning sensation, and it tends to be more constant uh, and more on a daily basis. Um, often there can be bad breath associated with it as well. Uh, fullness, lots of burping going on as well with it. So if you burp a lot, that could be one cause. Could be other things too. Uh, nausea, and then in severe cases, you could actually be vomiting out uh, what looks like coffee grinds. It's like black color because of the blood in the stomach or there could be uh, stools are darker. So what do you do in the case of gastritis? A lot like what we talked about already, you got to remove food sensitivities. They may not be the main cause but they could be contributing a little bit so I always just do that. You know, when in doubt, if you don't know what to do, just remove food sensitivities. Um, then you have to kill the bugs. So if it is caused by H. pylori, you got to give it antibiotics or antimicrobials, okay? I don't care what people do. I've used both. I've recommended both. Uh, you want to protect the mucus lining, so that's where your demulcents come in. I think in this case, you do want to suppress stomach acid. And so um, there's some gray area, but in the case of gastritis, I'd be inclined to do it. Suppress it, reduce stomach acid acutely. I think proton pump inhibitors would be indicated for gastritis and ulcers acutely for a week or two to give the wound or the ulcer time to heal um, and then you get people off of them. Now you can also use herbs to do that. Combining things like chamomile, well I'll look at it in a second, uh, and then healing ulcers with vulnerase as well. Okay, So your demulcents, you must go with this. So DJO would be a great option with this, but so would be marshmallow, slippery elm, uh, licorice and tincture form, not the other two in tincture form. Your antacid, you might be going with meadow sweet for sure. You might even throw a little bit of cranes bill in there because it's going to be uh, an astringent that has some antacid effects. Uh, I've also found that chamomile has antacid effects as well. So does uh, ginger, which I didn't mention here. Um, some vulnerary anti ulcers would be chamomile, plantain, calendula. Those are all good options. Uh, if there's some bleeding going on or it's pretty severe, you might want to add an astringent in. Again, that's your cranes bill coming up there. And then antimicrobials, a whole slew of different ones would be indicated. Golden seal and myrrh. Now, I appreciate golden seal is a bitter. So giving bitters can aggravate these, but it can also get rid of the infection. So you might go, that's where you might want to add in that extra bit of uh, some of the antacids and some of the demulcents to um, make sure that you don't increase stomach acid in someone who's already irritated. Uh, so you might start with getting the ulcer to quiet down a bit before you go and kill off the bugs, okay? Now, 
I can't find, I've done, I've had successful cases treating gastritis. Um, I have not time to go through all my files, especially the paper files are, they're organized, but they're not or organized by condition. They're organized by patient name. I can't remember 99% of my patients have, to, but I haven't seen them for a couple months um, until I see their face, obviously. So here's a case. This is one that happened when I was a supervisor uh, at the college where this 45 year old woman came in, she had chronic heartburn. And we, the students asked a, bunk, a bunch of questions, so they, I'm kind of blaming them, I'm not fully, and it is, I was a supervisor, I should have caught it, but I wasn't taking the, the case specifically. So they had chronic heartburn on a daily basis. We asked them, have you, has your doctor ever uh, said you have an ulcer? And they said, no, I don't have an ulcer. We said, okay. Um, they also have a sore throat. So it sounded more like a reflux thing going on. Um, and it was better with Gaviscon. Gaviscon is kind of like a, uh, it's a demulcent drug, which is basically, it's made from algae and uh, I think it's got like aluminum hydroxide. It's basically a demulcent and an antacid combined, uh, I believe, uh, but it's a drug. So we thought she had only GERD going on, and um, we found out later on she didn't. She basically had H. pylori. But anyways, <clears throat> so on the first visit, we gave her gentian. We also gave her DGL. Now, the problem was we gave her gentian. The following week, we found out she was taking the gentian, and she took it repeatedly, but she didn't take any DGL because she couldn't find it. And so what ended up happening is we had aggravated things by giving the gentian and she wasn't doing the DGL. Um, we started trying to get her to do chamomile, marshmallow and probiotics, but she didn't do anything we told her to do. So when she came in, she stopped the gentian, but we kind of gotten things flared up on her. She wasn't compliant. We tried to get her to do stuff and then she stopped coming in to see us. So we kind of, we were off to a bad start there. We made everything worse and that kind of, she never came back. And, you know, when you ask a patient, do they have an ulcer? You may want to be more specific and say, have you been ruled out for H. pylori? And this case was over maybe 10 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, to be honest with you. I think it was a long time ago, this case, but I always kept it because I thought, yeah, that's a good learning tool where, we gave, so here's an example I talked about earlier on where ginger aggravated reflux. Here's a case where gentian aggravated heartburn because they had H. pylori. We asked if they had an ulcer, which H. pylori causes ulcers. They said no, but we didn't ask if they had H. pylori, right? So we kind of asked the wrong questions. So as a result, we made them worse and then they didn't come back. So they didn't sue us, but I feel kind of sheepish about that. Um, so again, if you want to avoid doing these things, just do demulcents on the first visit uh, and vulnerize and avoid uh, doing that. However, if she only had reflux, and then we just removed on the first visit food sensitivities and gave her a digestive bitter, nine times out of 10, they get better. So even though I often, you know, you don't always know, I'll tell the patient, I'm going to give you gentian, and if it makes it worse, you stop taking it and you let me know right away, and then you take some DGL to counteract that, okay? So it's always good to give DGL as well, okay? Um, bloating and gas, this is kind of a vague, lots of things can cause bloating and gas. People will complain, they look, they feel full, bloated, distended. They'll say, oh my God, it looks like I'm like three months pregnant. My belly kind of bulges out. Um, lots of things can, can cause it. And gas is basically flatulence, or you could have burping as another form of gas. Um, in general, food sensitivities can cause that. Uh, eating too much sugar can also cause that because it feeds your gut bacteria and they ferment it. Uh, I find if I eat bread with yeast, if I eat a lot of bread and I drink beer, I look bloated and and, uh, and distended. My fitted shirts start to pull a bit. I, I can feel it. This sort of everything, this sort of nothing fits right. Uh, too much fiber can also cause a lot of flat zones and bloating as well. And so even though beans and whole grains are good for you, some people have a food sensitivity and also could be fiber content in it. Okay. Uh, what else? Lactose intolerance can, uh, dysbiosis, so the wrong bugs in your system, 
Sometimes when people take a probiotic, it contains inulin, FOS, or chicory, or you might have some kind of food product. I someone gave me a bar. I thought the good life. I was at the gym and they had a some event going on. They gave out bars, and I ate one of the bars because it was supposed to be you know good for you. And I was just got bloated and was just passing a lot of gas. And then I read the, read the uh, ingredients in inulin, which is commonly added, which is good because it feeds you good bacteria, but it can be very gas forming. So if you fart a lot or have a lot of flatulence when you eat something, read and see if it has any of these things in it. Because these are prebiotics, which are good, but they often bother a lot of people. Also, if you're just not having a bowel movement regularly, that will make you feel bloated and can cause a lot of gas just because you're, you're plugged up, right? So even if you are having a bowel movement every day, it could just be that the transit time is slowed down. So there's a backlog. So things are still coming out, but what comes out today is what was supposed to come out yesterday or the day before, right? Uh, and then finally, if you're not digesting your food properly, that can also cause bloating and gas. So again, remove food triggers, promote digestion. You might want to supplement with an enzyme. So uh, beta-glucoxidase is an enzyme in the, uh, the supplement called Beano that people will take if they're eating beans, like kidney beans, because it helps to break down the... Uh, uh, the fiber that makes people gassy. Uh, again, you might want to promote bowel movement. So this may be, if someone's just bloated and gassy, it may just be, like I said, they're just not fully evacuating the bowels on a daily basis. So taking some magnesium or taking some fiber might help them. Um, you might get them to help expel the gas, and that's where a carminative can help, or taking some essential oils. Often cramping may be associated with this, so an antispasmodic or a carminative may help with that. And then finally, a probiotic can help bulk up the stool to promote bowel movements, but it also might help to um, shift out some of the bad bugs, or you might even have to take antimicrobials. I remember when I had Jardia, one of the classic uh, symptoms was a lot of burping and, and gas associated with it, and that was even before the diarrhea kicked in. So, so bloating and gas. Carminatives will give you some immediate relief of the bloating and gas, but it may not address the root cause, okay? So you might give this to someone for symptomatic relief, but it's not going to address the cause. So the bulk laxatives might address the cause, the bitters might address the cause, the antimicrobials might, and also removing food sensitivities. Uh-oh. Can you guys hear me okay? Someone says they can't hear me. So I don't know whether or not it's just one person's. Yeah, so it's just one person's. Sometimes people, you know, you lose me for a second. It could be one person's connection or all of them. So, um, so again, antimicrobials, here's a whole slew of them that you could use. You guys can read that. I mean, this is... I'm repeating the same thing. I'm just hopefully driving stuff into your heads, okay? So colic. Colic, there's different types of colic. Colic is basically cramping of smooth muscles. And so when you hear about a baby being colicky, all it means is that it's being a difficult baby, and it's probably because the kid's got some digestive upset. And the most likely cause of that is a food sensitivity, uh, is the big thing. And appreciate Kids can be colicky if they're breastfed because of something the mother can uh, eat. So like I told you the story with my wife drinking tea with milk in it. That bothered my you know, three-month-old daughter who was nursing. And even worse, if a child being uh, fed formula and not breast milk, and I realize that ideally, yes, every mother wants to, uh, ideally, every baby should breastfeed, but not every mother is capable or wants to or whatever the reason is. Um, and that's fine, that's their choice. But if they drink a cow-based uh, formula, that can aggravate them. They may have to switch to soy or to rice. So, um, and, you know, I guess any it's soy can bother them too, but generally less. So I find a lot of kids with formula-fed or eating certain foods, especially dairy, really, really bugs them. Um, and the only symptom in a child may be 
you know, they just can't stop crying because they've got gas trapped inside or they haven't had a bowel movement in a couple of days and they just feel bloated uh, and they're fidgeting and their abdomen's tight. So when a child like that, um, you got to figure out what the root cause is. Uh, and you got to make sure you get the mother on board. So it may not just be changing the infant's diet. If she's breastfeeding, then you got to figure out what the mother's eating. Okay. So remove the food triggers in the mother and the child. Reduce sugar because that can, I find that that makes kids a little bloated and colicky. Get those bowels working and maybe you give them a probiotic at this point to help with that. I don't usually give like fiber supplements to children, but, um, Relieving the bloating, you might give some carminatives. And I will give kids tinctures uh, with alcohol, 40% alcohol. And I don't really worry too much. And I might take, what I might do is in a child, I might take the tincture dose that I would normally give to the adult and dilute it in water. And if I'm looking at a baby going, okay, they weigh, you know, 10 pounds, I weigh 150 pounds, so I'll just take the one mil and add like 10 mils of water to a tap water, mix it up and give them some of that. So I'm diluting it kind of based on their weight. Um, and I find that works good. Kids respond, I mean, a little bit of alcohol is not going to hurt them in my opinion. Um, a little bit, of, throw some chamomile into it, a little bit of licorice, a little bit of fennel, um, and they're fine. Now, if you don't want to give them tinctures, that's fine. You can take... Uh, another thing I've done before is I'll take coconut oil and I'll take fennel seeds and chamomile and I'll crush it up and put it in that and then uh, mix it all up together and then I'll just take a little bit of the coconut oil just on my finger and just rub it in the inside of their mouth. And then you're basically using the coconut oil as a solvent to extract some of the essential oils in it and it gets some of the other components. So um, I might heat it up on the stove to try to get the essential oils out of the coconut oil. And with the peppermint, I might just grind the flowers with a mortar and pestle and just mix it right in with it. And just take a little bit and put it in their mouth. And that might be all you need. My kids, I don't know, they're, they love tinctures. So for them, it's like a treat for them to get a tincture. So um, I'm not worried about it hurting them. I'm more worried about them becoming alcoholics before they're four. But anyways, um, so you got to watch maybe from that standpoint uh, to make them taste too good. So... Relieve the bloating, decrease the cramping. Those would be carminatives there, antispasmodics, uh, and improve gut flora, okay? Now, if a kid has regurge, an infant has regurge, that's a food sensitivity. Like, if the kid has projectile vomiting, they don't generally do that unless they've eaten something that doesn't agree with you, okay? So your elimination diet, and then I usually just use chamomile, fennel, and sometimes some peppermint. Uh, do a little seed extract with the coconut, and grind up chamomile and peppermint with a mortar and pestle and then just add the powder to, to the coconut oil or do a tincture, okay? You could also do a tea as well. Uh, my daughter would drink anything, but she had a tummy. I'd give her licorice, chamomile, peppermint tea and just put it in a sippy cup and she'd just pound that back. She, she was great. She's getting fussier now, but she was great back then. Now with constipation, so... Not everyone who has constipation uh, is it a result of not eating enough fiber. So in order to have a proper bowel movement, you have to ensure there's good hydration to the stool and fiber can help absorb water and add bulk to the stool and that stimulates your stretch receptors. Um, but another common thing, so let's say, assuming the person eats lots of fruits and vegetables and they still having a bowel movement every day, it's probably going to be a food sensitivity, okay? And that's the biggest thing I find. I find eggs do that a lot, and so does dairy. So people with dairy sensitivities, they could get diarrhea or they get constipation. Um, I remember there was a little, uh, like a 10-year-old girl who came into the clinic once, and her mother basically force-fed her milk every day, and the kid would vomit in the shower. I don't know why in the shower. She'd always vomit in the shower. She was nauseous and bloated. She constipated. And the mother was forcing her to drink milk think it was good for her. And I said, stop giving her milk. And the kid was cured of all her problems within like a few days. Uh, it was very, very dramatic. Um, so food sensitivity is very important to rule out. 
And most people do really well when they just follow those red flag foods at the beginning there. So dairy and eggs and gluten can go either way with people. Uh, another interesting thing is there are certain bugs called um, uh, that are methane producing bacteria. And when you look at bugs that inhabit the gut, some of them can produce hydrogen gas, some of them can produce methane gas. And there's a test you can do where you basically get the patient to drink lactulose and depending on the type of uh, gas that they're expelling through their mouth uh, at various time points, it can tell you whether they're releasing methane gas or hydrogen gas. And the methane gas seems to be associated with constipation while the uh, hydrogen gas is associated more with uh, diarrhea. So I'll show you a case of that in a second. Also drugs like opiates and some other drugs can have an issue. Uh, inactivity is another issue, but uh, in general, drink more water, try to get fiber in your diet. Uh, in a healthy breakfast that I'm recommending with the flax, chia, and the hemp, and the walnuts and the berries, there's a lot of fiber in that. And that's another beautiful thing about that is it just helps to normalize bowel. So even people don't realize they're constipated, they're having a bowel balloon every day, but they find that that additional fiber really helps get things moving. And also you're avoiding eggs and dairy that tend to, you know, cereal and milk or bacon and eggs often can cause constipation in some people. So with acute constipation, what I want to do in this case is just get those bowels working. And so that's where I use either an osmotic laxative like magnesium or a stimulating laxative like Senna, okay? Um, I don't give people bulk laxatives if they haven't had a bowel movement for a day or two, okay? You also want to normalize peristalsis, and carminatives are a nice complement to stimulating laxative or, or osmotic laxatives. Uh, often with the, um, with the constipation, you get bloating and cramping pains. So carminatives and antispasmodics, assuming they're not suppressive, can really help with that. Um, but also the laxatives themselves, when they get the bowels moving, sometimes Senna can cause griping or, or cramping pain, and that's where things like fennel or chamomile can be added to kind of help balance out a bit, okay? Again, acute constipation, please don't give people a big bolus of like psyllium husk fiber. Um, that'll just go in their bowels and expand and then start to ferment and try to, it's like it's trying to push things through the digestive tract and if they're already plugged up because they're constipated, uh, it's like trying to drive a truck, you know, through a uh, through a traffic jam. It's just not, not gonna end well, okay? So, I use acute constipation, mostly magnesium. You could use senna and you could use castor oil or any of the other anthroquinone containing like uh, anthroquinone glycoside containing herbs. But because magnesium is not, it doesn't have to be habit forming, a lot of people benefit. It helps with anxiety, it helps with muscle tension, it helps with stress, it helps with a bunch of stuff. I just prefer it and it tastes better. But I do, I have used senna and castor oil. I've used ca also castor oil, like if someone used to suspect had uh, their gut flora was really messed up and they had like small intestinal bacteria or overgrowth, I might get them antimicrobials combined with castor oil to try to flush out everything that's in the small intestine as well. Uh, because it does have that affinity, if you remember, to uh, basically increases peristalsis in both the small and the large intestine. And then you Carminatives, fennel, anise, peppermint, caraway, those are the big ones. Again, most of the time I just use fennel, peppermint, ginger would fall in that as well. Um, but even though I'm only listing a couple, appreciate there's at least 15 carminatives that you could use, like coriander, or rosemary, like all those other essential oils that are in your, uh, 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 your kitchen, probably, uh, could be used. But... In tincture form, I only carry one because fennel tastes nice and I don't need to have 15 bottles of things that do the same thing, okay? Now, with sluggish bowels, this is a different thing. So sluggish bowels and constipation, my opinion, this is more related to, again, food sensitivities is a huge thing. If they're not... If they're suffering from some atonic digestion where their digestive function is kind of sluggish, then they're not going to be breaking down the foods efficiently. They're not going to be stimulating the release of bile. So giving a bitter can help with people with chronic constipation. And this is also like if they're having a bowel bin almost every day, 
this is where giving them uh, extra fiber, maybe as in the form of psyllium, or getting them to eat that healthy breakfast, or taking a probiotic, also how the bulking agent would be beneficial. And they can then have something like an osmotic laxative like magnesium to take as needed. Um, and then with the added benefits of helping with sleep and muscle tension, uh, it doesn't hurt to have it around. I usually use uh, magnesium citrate, but this glycinate would also work. They might get some cramping pains. You could get some carminatives. They're never bad to say, look, if you get a little bit of bloating and cramping, get some peppermint chamomile tea. Probiotics are always a good thing. You may have to uh, give antimicrobials depending on what's going on as well. And then relieve the bloating with, again, carminatives. Okay. Uh, so there's your bulk laxatives, different options you've got there, bitters, carminatives. We talked about all that. Osmotic laxatives, there's a few different ones. Uh, magnesium kiwis and prunes contain sorbitol. And sorbitol uh, uh, is an alcohol sugar that doesn't get absorbed into circulation, so it stays in the bowel and kind of pulls water in, just like how magnesium does. So that's why prune juice, which is essentially void of fiber, is so effective for constipation. And then taking vitamin C would do that as well, okay? Sometimes when you get people to add more oil, like a fish oil supplement to their diet, or take a flaxseed oil, or even just drinking olive oil, that can get the bowels working as well, okay? Uh, so here's... Okay, here's a couple of interesting cases. So here is CL. She's a woman who had chronic constipation. She also had elevated cholesterol, triglycerides, and she was overweight. She had bloating almost every single day, uh, and it was about an 8 out of 10. She just felt awful, and she had a bowel movement every other day. So she wasn't severely constipated, according to maybe medical doctors, but she definitely didn't have good bowel health. So her assessment was chronic constipation. We assumed she had a food sensitivity was the main cause. That was causing the bloating just because she wasn't going to the washroom. She was overweight, so we know her diet's not great to begin with, and her cholesterol's off. So with her, the first week, we removed the red flag foods, gave her the healthy breakfast, so we gave her fiber with the healthy breakfast. We gave her gentian, a digestive bitter, and we said drink chamomile and pepper and pea, tea when you're feeling bloated. And then uh, after two or three weeks, she felt a lot better. And then she still wasn't perfect. She still said, you know what? I still feel I'm not fully evacuating the bowels. We're still playing with the diet. And then I said, look, if you feel that way, just take some magnesium. There's no harm. So she might not take this every day, but she was take, adding it in a little bit here and there. And that was just enough to kind of help to evacuate the bowels. So by a month and a half or two, she basically no longer had the constipation. She was going to the washroom every day, and her bloating was pretty much gone away. And I don't imagine she's going to stick with the gentian forever or the chamomile and peppermint tea. Um, and maybe she'll start playing around with her foods more. But appreciate we changed her diet. We She figured out that the dairy was definitely bugging her, the eggs was bugging her. Uh, we gave her a good... Good food, uh, good breakfast, and uh, helps prevent heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. Made her feel a lot better, and then she refers patients. So that's a nice, simple case. Okay. Now this is another case. Now I updated only this next couple slides because I was doing it at home, and I didn't have the chart because it was a paper chart, and I didn't have it on uh, my electronic medical records. So I had to kind of estimate some of the things that I could remember, but I wasn't sure. So this is a 26-year-old woman. Her, when I saw her, her chief complaint was uh, bloating and belching. It was mainly the belching that was really bugging her, and she had pretty sluggish bowels. She may have had a bowel every day or two is what she was sort of saying. So she had chronic constipation. I suspected she had food sensitivities as well, and she had bloating going on and burping. Um, but what was interesting, I'll show you, is that there are certain bugs which produce methane gas. And what they do is they slow the transit time. So some people who have constipation and assuming you've given the probiotics and removed the food sensitivities and fiber supplements and they're still, bowels are kind of sluggish. If they're feeling bloated, then you gotta make sure you also rule out potentially things like ovarian cancer and other more serious causes of bloating or fibroids or, or pregnancy. <laughs> um, but, it could also be due to these methane-producing bugs. And so 
with her, what we did is we did a SIBO breath test with her where she drinks a bunch of lactulose sugar and then she uh, basically measures it over a period of time. And what she found was, now these two points here are just showing that uh, she didn't do it properly, but she's not producing any hydrogen gas. And hydrogen gas is associated with diarrhea. She's only producing the uh, methane gas. And that methane gas, uh, in her case, may have been the cause, not the only cause, but one of the contributing factors to all this burping she was getting all the time. And like her burping was driving her nuts. And so the burping was an eight out of 10. It was a little different. Sorry, I didn't change it here. I said nine out of 10, but she, when I checked back in the chart, it was only eight out of 10. I fixed this this morning. So we've got to remove her red flag foods, eat the healthy breakfast. We started off by doing gentian, camel, peppermint. And there was some improvements, but her constipation was still pretty consistent. Like changing her, her, her increase in the fiber and moving food sensitivities didn't really do much. Um, I think my plot here is not quite right. I gotta update that. We got the constipation, started to see a much better improvement in that once we started doing oil of oregano, antimicrobials, and a garlic supplement. And that's what really got the burping to improve. And sorry, my timeline here, I didn't adjust it quite right. It was sort of more following in line with this. But by the end of it, she was having regular bowel movements and they were normal again. And her burping almost went away. It took a while though. Like it was kind of up and down there for months. So maybe there was an antibiotic that could have helped improve that better. But, um, you know, she was an unusual case because she had both the burping and the constipation going on. Or I thought, maybe you got this SIBO thing going on with you. And uh, uh, when I was talking to the guy in the lab, he definitely said it, it made a difference. Uh, someone's got a couple questions I just saw. Uh, Tierra said, what do you mean by sluggish? Sluggish just means like the bowels are not fully evacuating every single bowel movement. So somebody could have a bowel movement every day, but they know that they've completely evacuated. Like when they're done going to the washroom, they're like, they feel rewarded. Uh, they feel, you know, content. Other times people can go three or four times a day. They're like, ah, oh, you know what? Like sit there, squeeze a little bit out. I don't feel great. So sluggish just means instead of you fully evacuating the bowels once or twice a day, it's could be a little bit every day or every other day. That's what I mean. So it doesn't really fall under the definition of constipation from a medical standpoint. Uh, it's more under a, um, sort of sluggish standpoint. Cholesterol foods. Uh, yeah, I know. Cholesterol foods. Uh, basically, nuts and seeds, chia flax, hemp, um, almonds, walnuts berries, there's a whole bunch of things. Some spices do as well. There's a, I've got a list of foods that I usually give people. Um, yeah, I know Genior Graph is different. Like I said, I was trying to do it last night, sitting in bed at 12 o'clock from memory, just enough to get it all ready so I could come to, to uh, uh, work early in the morning and then update it because I had a paper chart. So that's why it's different, uh, that one. Uh, so that was an interesting, an atypical case of uh, constipation. Now, diarrhea can be caused by all sorts of different things. If you've had it most of your life, you've had diarrhea on and off, probably food sensitivities. Uh, eating too much sugar can make anyone give anyone a little bit of diarrhea, also lactose intolerance. And you may be able to drink milk for your entire life and suddenly become lactose intolerant after some kind of infection. So infection could be a whole bunch of different types of bacteria, yeast, parasites, uh, amoeba, uh, amoebic, amoebias, um, amoebias, I don't know, amoebic dysentery, whatever they, amoebas, there, I don't know why my brain's, I was up too late, and, or I uh, went to bed too late and up too early, and there's autoimmune disease, these ones are trickier to treat, so these are using more anti-inflammatories uh, anti and immunomodulators, um, I had to get more cases like that that I can present, uh, certain drugs, stress, so again, what do you do? Anyone who comes in with diarrhea, even if it's an autoimmune cause, even if it's uh, an infectious cause, I still get them to remove food sensitivities on the first visit because often it may not eradicate it, but it may make them feel better. 
Now with infections, you might have to treat the infections with the antimicrobials, might give some probiotics. In some cases, you have to decrease inflammation if it's a chronic diarrhea. A lot of the herbs that you use for the other things or the dietary changes may affect that to some degree. Or you might have to add in some things like turmeric or boswellia or other anti-inflammatories. Depending on the severity, the biggest thing you got to worry about with diarrhea is hydration levels. So you may have to take an electrolyte solution because you can die of, if it's acute diarrhea and it's severe, uh, you can die just from dehydration. And then in some cases, usually with diarrhea, there's a lot of cramping and that's where antispasmodic carminatives can help. And then if they're bleeding because it's something like um, uh, dysentery or uh, uh, colitis thing going on where there's a lot of bleeding, uh, ulcerative colitis, then you may want to use some tannins for that as well. So for diarrhea in general, if you take more bulk laxatives, so if you take more fiber, Ironically, bulk laxatives not only work for constipation prevention, but also can help with diarrhea. And the way they work, I've told you guys before, they absorb water. So the fiber turns into a gel, absorbs water. And now imagine putting your hand out and pouring water through your hand, it slips through the fingers. You pour jello in your hand, you could hold on to jello. And that's why fiber can help. So when I had giardia, um, I took psyllium, several tablespoons a day and it just decreased the frequency and the urgency it didn't get rid of the cause of it but it helped various anti-diarrheal herbs uh, things like golden seal psyllium chamomile they all work by different mechanisms some of them are antimicrobials some of them have a bit of an uh, anti-secretory effect I would say cranes bill would also be in that category so astringents would also all have anti-diarrheal effects they tend to be more suppressive. There's a folk remedy of taking green bananas for diarrhea uh, in the tropics because of the stringency to it, okay? Um, antimicrobials, there's a whole slew of ones that you could use, and then there's some anti-inflammatory ones. There's, as an aside, there was a research study that showed that wormwood, which I never really thought of as an anti-inflammatory herb, uh, had benefit for keeping Crohn's disease in remission, which is kind of neat. So you could have a tincture with a various anti-inflammatories, including wormwood and an or capsule, and that might help uh, get things in remission. Um, I'll come back to you in a second, Jen, about methane gas. So here's a woman, I can't remember this case, I think I just added this one. Okay, good. Um, I didn't... In this, I haven't had a lot of infectious diarrhea cases in the last couple months. Uh, it's usually more food sensitivity ones. Uh, this woman came in and she had a bout of severe infectious diarrhea, lots of back, uh, lots of diarrhea, cramping, low blood pressure. So I didn't see her at this point. She went to the doctor emergency. They did a stool sample. She had a parasite. They took an antibiotic and she was about 80% improvement. But then when I saw her, 50% of her stools were normal. The other ones weren't normal. And it was worse when she ate certain things. She had several bowel movements a day, kind of form, not really. Um, and she basically was suffering from bloating and cramping and urgency when she did have a bowel movement. So it was kind of a low-grade chronic diarrhea. And uh, so, like usual, I gave her the red flag foods, told her to eat a healthy breakfast. Uh, and those two things would address, increase the fiber and remove possible things that could be contributing to it. Now, because she's got inflammation, she may be more sensitive to foods that she wasn't before. So, um, if someone has, uh, infectious diarrhea or some kind of chronic diarrhea thing going on, uh, or if it's infectious and you kill off the bug and you heal the gut up, they can go back and eating some of these foods later on, uh, with some success. Because I was suspecting it was some kind of infection, we gave her an essential oil capsule. I won't tell you the name of the company, but they contain peppermint, thyme, and oregano, or essential oils in it. So we got her to do one cap a day of that as an antimicrobial, but also because it had peppermint oil helps with the abdominal pain and also the cramping. Now, we didn't discuss a lot of Chinese herbs, uh, but this is the Chinese formula. Uh, it's also called intestinal fungus formula. So I'm using this as an example that I don't always just use herbs. The reason why I like sometimes using these guys is 
Um, not everyone wants to drink tinctures, and I particularly like this formula. So I gave her that, some psyllium, some chamomile. To make a long story short, her diarrhea was about a 5 out of 10 when she came in because it wasn't like it was a 10 out of 10, but then she went on antibiotics. So the bug causing the 5 out of 10 is probably different than the bug causing the 10 out of 10. So maybe she's got a yeast overgrowth in her gut, who knows what. But you can see basically by you know a month, we have completely normalized her bowels and got everything back to normal by removing the food sensitivities and taking the antimicrobials. Uh, and she took it for just over probably about a month. Okay, so could I use Western herbs today? Yeah, sure you could, but not everybody likes the taste of the uh, of the herbs that I would give to that. Uh, but they also work. I can tell you that from experience. But sometimes this one works. Sometimes my other herbs work. I mix them up. So, uh, but like I said, I do use some Chinese patterns as well. So. I already talked about SIBO. I just thought I'd throw in a couple of these cases. These are people who I basically, what SIBO is a small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and you can do a breath test for it. Now, the thing with the breath test is I think you get false positives. Not everybody who necessarily has a positive to the breath test has SIBO. It could just, like if you have methane producing bacteria all throughout your intestinal tract and it's loaded in your bowels as well as your small intestine, it's probably going to cause constipation, but H. pylori infections could, would probably also be a false positive, and it could be other things. But the point is, is if someone has an aggravation of symptoms when they eat sugars in general and they produce more gas, it's probably some kind of bug is doing something. And in the case of this, if they test positive for hydrogen gas, that seems to be associated with uh, bacteria that cause diarrhea, while methane gas is associated with bugs that cause constipation. I've run this test probably a 10 times in the past year on people between my wife and I. I think she ran a couple and I ran the other ones, maybe, maybe eight times. And what's interesting, I didn't include them all here. Every single person that I, and it's not the first thing I do, it's always kind of like a last resort when I can't figure it out the other ways. And what I found is this guy, his hydrogen levels, uh, he had chronic diarrhea and his hydrogen gas is considered high, not off the chart, high. And he didn't respond to some of the other things. So he came back positive for the hydrogen gas. This person also came back really, really high to the hydrogen gas and his symptoms are far more severe. So he's up around 140 while this guy was only up around 30. His is like maybe a two or a three, but it was chronic. While this guy was like a 10 out of 10 when he came in and he couldn't eat anything. And when we did the test, he was off the chart. And so we basically gave him rounds and rounds of antimicrobials, all different natural ones. We told him there's an antibiotic he might want to try as well, but he wants to do the natural route. And he's still not cured. It's been like four months or five months, but he's able to eat probably three or four times as much as you did before and he was taking berberine and oregano oil and a bunch of other antimicrobials. So, I mean, if it was me, I'd probably take the antibiotic, but uh, he chose not to. And this is another person who had chronic, she missed up a few of her time points here for some reason, she messed up the test, but um, basically you drink the sugar and then at different time points, you breathe into a tube and measure how much hydrogen gas and methane gas you're producing. And again, she's very high and she's another person that, um, responded well to changing her diet, but it still wasn't curing everything, okay? So I just kind of threw these in. SIBO is a kind of a controversial thing. Medical doctors don't do it. Some doctors like it, some don't. But there's a correlation I've seen. Every single person except for one guy who I think had autoimmune colitis who had diarrhea, every other person who I've tested for this, um, five of the six people that I tested in the past year all had high amounts of hydrogen gas, and the person that I tested who had constipation had the methane gas. So there seems to be something to these things anyways. So what is IBS? IBS is basically uh, when you've got messed up bowels and it can do be predominantly diarrhea or constipation or it can be alternating constipation, diarrhea, or there's pain. My opinion, you either have a food intolerance, which could be 
immune mediated or it could be like a lactose intolerant where you lack the enzyme to break down sugars or it could be a fat absorption issue or it could be some kind of weird bug in your gut so it could be yeast overgrowth it could be a parasite it could be bacteria um could be a bunch of things um uh, and then stress usually isn't the cause i think you usually have either foods bugging you or dysbiosis and kind of so either a combination of food and bugs, and then the stress just pushes it over the edge sometimes, okay? So with the IBS, it's the same as what we talked about for the constipation and diarrhea. Identify food sensitivities, eradicate infections, improve digestion, bulk up the stool, reduce urgency, decrease pain, manage stress, you know? Um, maybe that's the one thing that's a little bit different. So nothing's new here. This is all the same sort of things that we've discussed already, okay? Now, some people could have uh, yeast overgrowth in their systems. And I think this is overdiagnosed, but definitely you get people who have come in who have chronic yeast issues in their body. Sometimes uh, chronic yeast overgrowth may be that the person gets recurrent vaginal yeast infections every single week or month. And in that case, sometimes when people take drugs and do intravaginal drugs to try to kill off the yeast, it gets rid of the problem for period of time but then they come back and that's because the yeast don't just teleport to the vaginal area they migrate from the intestinal tract into the vaginal area and so if someone has to take basically antifungal drugs intravaginally every month you haven't addressed the root cause which is the yeast is in the gut now medical doctors uh, don't always consider yeast in the gut to be a problem um, Yeast is a normal part of your gut flora, but it's all about the relative amounts of it. So if someone had a history of taking antibiotics or anti-malarial drugs, because they can cause yeast overgrowth as well by disrupting the gut flora, um, or depending on their diet, or if they've had a, some kind of infection or poor immune function, lots of things could contribute to this. Um, and definitely treating this is, is important. So what do you do for it? You want to eradicate the infection, improve your gut flora, stimulate the immune system if it's low, reduce sugar, which tends to feed yeast. I would avoid dietary yeast because I think in a lot of cases there's a cross reactivity with dietary yeast and uh, uh, with dietary yeast and also with um, uh, the yeast in your gut that's living there. So the bugs may stimulate your immune system to target them. And then when you eat a piece of bread that has yeast in it, I think those antibodies also react to that and can worsen symptoms. And then also the bloating, because these yeasts, when they ferment things, they produce a lot of gas and cause discomfort, okay? So that's the general approach. Antimicrobials and carminatives are the main things that I would want to use for that. To give you a case, here's a woman. She came in with chronic vaginal yeast infections that she's had for basically 20 years, okay? And she's tried several different tri types of antifungal drugs and she was resistant to them and when she showed up in our office she's like i think you guys are a bunch of quacks and i was like okay well it's nice being you buddy why are you here if you think we're quacks and she said well my medical doctor says they can't help me and refer me to you guys and i said okay good so the patient also had bipolar uh which is just sort of as a side note she had a lot of depression and mania going on she had chronic heartburn as well it's been going on for years so she was on some meds and a few other things. Now, we changed her diet, um, which improved her GERD, but uh, we gave her DGL, some garlic supplement, dietary changes, oral probiotics. No real improvements in the vaginal yeast infections at that point. Um, but she did see some improvements in her heartburn symptoms and a reflux as well as some other bloating and digestive issues. And this is using the MyMop scale. So six is as bad as it gets. It's like a 10 out of 10 when it's a six, okay? And then um, we gave her a tincture of herbs as well as vaginal probiotics. Like it's a supplement that has probiotics in it as well as there's some garlic in it as well, which apparently doesn't kill the bug, the good bacteria. Anyways, to make a long story short, her vaginal yeast infections basically uh, got dramatically better, but we may have been killing it off too aggressively because she found that her moods were a little bit aggravated when she's taking it. But after 
couple months, what we found was that we completely eradicated the vaginal yeast infections. And it was the first time in literally 20 years she didn't have a vaginal yeast infection. Her heartburn was totally gone and her mood stabilized for the first time in months. And that seems a weird correlation with a lot of people with uh, chronic, what I suspect is yeast overgrowth in the gut, that it seems to affect their neurotransmitters and causes some anxiety and depression and, and disproportion for what they should be experiencing. So sometimes with people with chronic mood disorders, improving your gut flora, and there's a lot of research coming out, can help with that as well. So anyways, that's kind of a neat case. Uh, drugs didn't work, so three different types of antifungal drugs she was resistant to, and then when she tried ours, um, after a couple of months, she was basically almost cured of that, and her mood stabilized, which is great. So she loved us after that, by the way. Uh, so you know what I should do? I don't want to really rush through these cases. No, I can't rush through these cases. So what we'll do is we'll continue this next week. Uh, and then we have a safety lecture next week. And then if we go over a little bit, then we may have to uh, spill over into the last lecture. Uh, and then I'll post some cases uh, either this week or next week that you guys can use as a study guide to try. What I like about the final exam is you'll still have about 75 questions, but there's a lot of repetitions of stuff, you have, stuff you've already heard. So it's, in a lot of ways, it doesn't require you to memorize as much stuff, as, uh, which is good. And it, a lot of the stuff we keep kind of coming up over and over again, okay? Uh, so do you guys, so how do you find that lecture? Is it okay? Is it, did you like that? Is that those cases interesting for you guys? I think these, I, I find these cases interesting because it's not theoretical. This is real, real people and real stuff going on, um, which I think is really neat. Uh, and I think learning the cases helps to kind of link things together as well. Uh, okay. So, um, so I think the strategy, have, sorry, did any of you guys watch the um, the videos that I posted already or not? Just out of curiosity if you guys are trying to watch them in advance or if nobody has yet, which I'm fine with. You guys can watch them whenever you want. I'm just wondering if it's useful. So a couple of people not yet, okay. Uh, Yeah, so Bianca's asking uh, about an exam question. I definitely would ask, like, a simple case might be, like, just so that you're aware. I could ask, I'm not asking, like, tons of these, but there could be a question where this could be the case. And I could ask, you know, you read the case over, and I say, which of the following combinations of actions would be best suited for this patient? Is it A, hepatoprotective, carminative, stimulating laxative? Is it B, demulcent, bitter, you know, whatever, antacid? And then you would sort of choose based on that. Um, the other thing that I might do is say, based on the following case, I could ask what actions, or I might say, what herbs would you want to give in the formula? Would you like to give formula A? A carminative, or sorry, a golden seal, milk thistle, gentian, or B, chamomile, gentian, whatever. So that would that'd be another way I could do it. I'm not making these like overly difficult, and I'm trying to stay clear so that it's like pretty obvious, like, because there's a lot of gray area. Like, there's, there's not one formula for this case, there's a million different formulas and combinations with amounts, you know? So, uh, also, as I mentioned before, you might find it useful when you're reviewing your herbs. Uh, there's a link that I posted that, even though I'm probably logged out right now, but I'll show you what I mean. So, I think I'm logged out, but I don't know. 
So even if you don't purchase access, the little summary is a useful little thing, I think, for a lot of these herbs uh, to kind of give you a little overview. And you might find it useful to click that link because they're all there and you can kind of go through them and use it. Um, and you want to purchase access and support it, that would be awesome. Okay. Uh, again, this is more of a labor of love. It's not a, a lucrative thing. Um, okay, I think we're good. Any other questions? Okay. You guys have a wonderful day, and we will see you guys next week, okay? Sounds good. Bye for now.